Hello and welcome to Star Cells and God. This is the show where we discuss new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science that have theological and philosophical implications. These discoveries demonstrate the reality of God's existence and the reliability of the Old and the New Testaments. My name is Fuzz Rana and today I'm joined in studio by Dr. Hugh Ross. Hugh is an, uh, an astronomer, astrophysicist. I am a biochemist and we're going to be talking today about biochemical finite state machines and uh, the extinction event that brought about the demise of the dinosaurs uh, about uh, 65 million years ago. Uh, we both work for an organization called Reasons to Believe. And if you want to know more about our organization, please go to our website, www.reasons.org. You can also follow us on social media, RTB underscore official. And then last but not least, if you're watching this on YouTube, go to uh, the subscribe button and subscribe to our channel or hit the bell and you can be notified when new episodes of Star Cells and God drop. So anyway, uh, Hugh, uh, let's go ahead and, sure. and get started. And I think I drew the short straw, so I'll go, I'll go first and, uh, and then we'll uh, pick up your discovery next. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think it was, it's probably true for you, Hugh, when you were in graduate school, that it was long days and long nights, not only studying, but also making observations and doing other types of, of work for your well, PhD. like me, I got by four hours sleep a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think th that's probably pretty true for most graduate students in the sciences. Uh, you know, for me, it was, you know, long days and long nights. And uh, many of the long nights actually took place when I was actively doing my PhD research, the lab work, where you experiments had to be had to be run to completion, and sometimes that meant staying uh, up very late at night working in the lab. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't a lonely, sad experience. I, number one, liked working in the lab in those days, and two, many of my fellow graduate students were there working late as well. So there was a, a bit of a camaraderie that developed. And one of the downsides, of course, working that late was uh, getting hungry, and there wasn't usually much to eat. Uh, and so, the only thing that uh, you had many times as a food option was the vending machine on the third floor of Clippinger Labs uh, in the in the common area. And Clippinger Labs housed both the chemistry and physics departments. And so the vending machines were kind of a congregation point uh, in grad school. And it wasn't uncommon to, to see somebody at the vending machine late at night trying to get a snack. Sadly, it was not uncommon to see somebody at the pounding on the vending machine <laughs> because, you know, like most vending machines, it, it, it would do things like this where you, you would order the snack uh, after you put your money in and it wouldn't completely dispense, get stuck in the machine. And so people would kind of pound on the machine to try to get their snack out. So uh, anyway, but all that. If to, you got a snack at all, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you got a snack at all. So. Uh, <laughs> Even though that vent particular vending machine wasn't very reliable, when you think about it for a minute, vending machines actually represent a fairly remarkable machine. They're, it's a pretty sophisticated technology that allows you to put in coins and, and then select the particular snack item that you want. And vending machines actually are a real-life example of something known as a finite state machine. And... Uh, I will explain what a finite state machine is in a minute, uh, but this is essentially uh, a, a diagram showing uh, how vending machines will receive coins in order to dispense uh, the food item, and it shows you, in a sense, that the type of computation or algorithm that's being employed by the machine. And Fuzz, you're dating yourself. It's nickels and dimes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know of any vending machine that works with nickels and dimes anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> Many of them take credit cards now. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, a finite state machine is essentially a machine that can exist in a number of discrete states, and that machine will transition from one state to the other based on the input provided in, into the machine. Uh, and uh, the, the, the transition, it depends upon the nature of the input. It also depends upon the state that the machine is in when it receives that input. And, and finite state machines are actually uh, uh, 
uh, kind of uh, mathematical tools that uh, mathematicians, engineers, computer scientists use uh, to model different phenomena or to design technology or design computer programs. In fact, um, the finite state machine concept is very important when you're developing a computer program, which usually consists of subroutines. So you could think of those subroutines as the state of the computer program. And then depending on the input that you provide, that subroutine might work on the input producing an output. But sometimes the input will cause one subroutine to transition to another subroutine. And that's essentially a state transition. Uh, and that's uh, the process of a, of a, or the operation of a finite state machine with the idea that those transitions create some kind of functional mm -hmm. uh, re response on the part of the machine. And so uh, finite state machines are not only these mathematical tools that are used, again, by engineers and computer scientists, but they actually exist in real life. And, and people may be learning about finite state machines for the very first time watching this episode, but believe it or not, uh, finite state machines are all around us. So with the uh, vending machine, it can tell the difference between a quarter, right. a nickel, and a dime. Right. It can even tell the difference between a Canadian nickel and an American nickel. Yes, so. yeah, exactly. Well, the simplest example of a, of a finite state machine would be a door. Okay. Right? And so the door's function is to either block entry into a room or grant access to the room, right? And and the door can exist in two states, closed or open. And so if the door is open and you push on the door, you close it, right? So the two inputs would be pushing and pulling on the door. So if the door is in an open state, pushing it closes it, blocking entry to the room, if it is in a closed state and you pull on it, the door will open, granting access to the room. So there's two states and the, there's two inputs. Now, if the door is open and you pull on it, nothing happens. And so that input is only relevant, relevant if the door is closed. So the state of the machine depends upon, uh, it, it is, is relevant in terms of what kind of input is going to affect the transition. And of course, if it's closed and you push on it, it, nothing's going to happen. That input is irrelevant if the door is in a closed state. So that's an example of a, of a, a simple finite state machine. A combination lock is another one, right, real quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and here it now depends upon to go from a lock, uh, sorry, an unlocked state to an unlocked state requires putting in the right combination, which is the right sequence of inputs. So th there's a sequence of three inputs that need to be effective before the machine will transition from one state to the other. So finite state machines can be simple. They can be incredibly complex. Perhaps yeah, everybody is familiar with, you know, we talked about a vending machine, but with an ATM, that also is an example of a finite state machine. Now, something interesting about finite state machines is you can think of them as mechanical computers, Right where there's input, there's some kind of mechanical activity or maybe electrical activity. That if, you, if you have electronics in the finite state machine, that will then transition the machine from one state to the other, producing a function. But even though it's, it's a computer in that sense, a mechanical computer, it doesn't have, at least at first glance, the capacity for data storage. It doesn't have memory. It doesn't really operate according to any kind of algorithm. But then when you begin to press into the operation of a finite state machine, you realize that the data and the memory and the algorithms are actually built into the very design of the machine itself, right? And so uh, the, the finite state machines are very sophisticated mechanical machines where you have instantiated in the structure of the machine the information that the machine needs to take input and produce outputs. Now, uh, about a year ago, a research team was studying a single-celled eukaryotic organism named Euplodes, and this is a picture of, of, the, of mm -hmm. this uh, organism. It's kind of a flattened, ovoid-shaped, single-celled organism that has a, a top and a bottom, a dorsal and a ventral side. And on the ventral side are these little structures called cirri 
that are that function like feet. And so this organism can swim in the uh, in the in water, but if it encounters a solid surface, it'll actually walk along the surface. And these researchers became interested in this organism because it kept contaminating their experiment. They were trying to do an experiment, and this organism kept contaminating. Uh, so they changed their research to <laughs> yeah, and 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 as they began, you know, under the microscope watching the organ the contaminants, you know, they became fascinated with how the organism moves around, how its gating action, its walking action, uh, and um, because the 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 people have known about this organism for, gosh, nearly two hundred years. And some researchers watching the action, the, the gating action of this organism, speculated a number of years ago that maybe this thing has a primitive nerve system, that it, it seems to be able to respond to what's happening in the environment and change its walking behavior in a, a similar manner to a, a, an animal, a complex multicellular organism. And, and so the big question is, how does this organism engage in this this gating activity? And here's a, a, a an image of an electron micrograph, oh, or it's wow. not a, of a micrograph, of the organism walking along the surface. And so you can see the little feet. Well, it turns out that they did this very detailed study of this organism, where they would record video image images and then do a frame by frame by frame analysis, looking at the movement of the of the feet, and they discovered that this thing is operating like a finite state machine, that when it's walking, it's essentially walking in a in a in a manner in which the different feet or the Siri are undergoing transitions from one state to the other, and the Siri are connected to what are known as microtubules. Uh, in, there's a network of microtubules that the Siri are connected to, and so they speculate that it's probably some kind of conformational change in that network that actually is leading to the transition from one state to the other. And just for the sake of completeness, this is what a picture of a, of a microtubule looks like. It's composed of a protein called tubulin, which consists of two subunits, the alpha and beta tubulin, and then each of those subunits kind of interlock with one another to form what's called a, a protofilament, and there are 13 protofilaments that align to form the, the microtubule. And then these microtubules then form these networks inside cells. And so this is an example of a, a microtubule network that's been extracted, I think, uh, from a, a, a some type of eukaryotic cell. Uh, and so these microtubules give structural rigidity to the cell, that, so they serve as what's called the cytoskeleton. They serve as trackways, so there are these molecular motors like kinesin and dynein that will move. Transportation systems. Yeah, that will yeah. move along them like a highway system moving right. cellular cargo. Uh, they also are involved in cell division, uh, and now it looks as if as if they're playing a role as in terms of regulating the motility of of this particular uh, single celled organism. But they're doing it again uh, as as a as a finite state machine. And so this is the first example of the discovery of a, a biochemical finite state machine. And so this is what the researchers write uh, in the abstract. They say, we found that cellular walking entails highly regulated transitions between a discrete set of gate states. Uh, the set of observed transitions decomposes into a small group of high improbability, temporarily irreversible transitions, forming a cycle and a large group of low probability time symmetric transitions, thus revealing stereotypy in sequential patterns of state transitions. Taken together, these findings implicate a finite state machine-like process. Siri are connected by microtubule bundles, and we found that the dynamics of Siri involve different state transitions associated with the uh, structure of the microtubule bundle systems. Perturbative experiments reveal that the fibers mediate gate coordination, suggesting a mechanical basis of gate control. A lot of technical language, but in other words, what they, they observed by, again, this detailed analysis is that mathematically, the, the walking behavior is identical to what you'd expect if it was indeed a finite state machine. There's a whole lot of questions as precisely how this works. Of course, they've got some insight here. And they suggest in the paper 
that maybe the, the concept of a finite state machine might be useful uh, in studying biochemical phenomena, that, it, that there might be other examples of biochemical finite state machines. Now, I, I've written a blog article about this, and that was about a year ago or so that the and what's your blog called? Um, the cells design. Yeah, the blog is the cells design, right. and the article is something like uh, biochemical finite machines point to an infinite creator or something like that. So they can search and find it. Yeah, yeah. Now, to me, the the, the theological implications of this uh, can. Well, before you go there, <clears throat> did the researchers actually study what happens with the microtubules in the Siri when they're in a fluid situation? No, no, they didn't do that at all. It was just simply looking, doing a gait analysis, gait and analysis. it was limited to essentially looking at the movement of individual feet and, and then mathematically characterizing that, that movement. So they, 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 they implicate the, the um, microtubule bundles by virtue of the fact that, um, that the Siri are attached to them and that when right. you perturb the microtubules, you see it, it impacting the gating. So there's a lot of questions that haven't really been addressed. But I presume they did address the fact that when uh, the uh, microbe feels a solid surface, that creates different stresses on the microtubules, which yes. again causes yes. the Siri to react in a different way. Right. But it, I'd be interested in how different the stresses are from say swimming in a well, open, when open the, when it swims, it uses a different set of of, of, of Siri. Uh, yeah, well, the, the, these would be either flagella or or, okay. or or something like that. So the Siri Cilia, are not involved in fluid mo motion. Yeah, there's a yeah. So there's there's a diff there's a different set of structures emanating from the the. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, because what it tells me is that the stress in the microtubules either engages a Siri or it engages the flagella. Yes, probably. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at an incredibly sophisticated system here, to be, to be certain, right? You know, it, that, that isn't, that's really, you know, poorly understood. But it's remarkable because, again, people have looked at a number of these single-celled eukaryotic organisms and detect very sophisticated behavior, and it's to the point where people have been tempted, again, to say, is there some kind of rudimentary nervous system going on here? Now, if you think about it, a nervous system is taking input from the environment, processing it, and then dictating activity based on that information that's being, you know, interpreted by a brain. But this is where the finite state machine concept comes into play because it's a mechanical computer. And so what you have going on here is you've got this mechanical computer that appears to be designed to take specific types of input, undergo state transitions, uh, and then, you know, as a result of that, create functional activity where, again, the, the data, the memory, the algorithm is built into the, into the microtubules and into the Siri and the nature of the interactions and the conformational stage transitions that take place that are triggered by other input that that, 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 you know, that, that microtubule bundle, bundle is experiencing. So this is a very sophisticated system. Uh, and, you know, when you think about a computer system operating, it's operating uh, according to programming that gives it the sense that the, the computer system has some type of intelligence of sort. And what's happened, of course, is you've programmed it to behave in a way that it's taking input and in a very sophisticated way producing output, creating functionality. So that's what you see, you know, happening here. Hence the analogy of the vending machine. The right. vending machine doesn't have a brain or a nervous system, right. but has been designed to respond to physical stimuli. Y exactly. But of course, somebody has to design. Has to design it in the first place. So you have to model the machine, you know, and then you have to literally build the machine in such a way to take that input in, in, you know, and the more sophisticated the machine, the, you know, the, the, the more sophisticated, you know, or the demands of the machine, the more sophisticated the design. And it's got to be able to respond to thermodynamic unexpectancies, like someone kicking yeah. the vending machine yeah. or this particular microbe bumping into an unusually hard surface. Yeah. Now, um, something that has, has intrigued me for a long time that to me has you know profound theological implications, and that's this idea 
that there seems to be this interplay, this interrelationship between the technologies we build and the technologies that we see in, inside cells at a biochemical level, right? So that, that when we are, look to characterize biochemical systems, many times by looking at the similarities between those systems and the technologies we build, we gain insight into the structure and the operation of those machines. We also are now at the point where people are gaining insight into the operation of these machines and from that are actually designing new technologies. This is called bio... Bio-inspiration. Yeah, yeah, right. And so to me, that, that interplay is really very provocative and it, and it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're thinking about life's history in, in the design of living systems as the product of an unguided, undirected evolutionary process. Uh, why would you? Why would that kind of interplay between our technology and the nature of biochemical systems even exist? But if biochemical systems are the work of a creator, and we're made in God's image to be kind of mini creators ourselves, then of course the technology we produce is going to give us understanding uh, into the the operation of biochemical systems when we see analogs to that technology. Right. And we recognize it. Likewise, if it's the, the the technology in the cell is designed by a creator, an all-powerful, all-knowing creator, then of course that would be a great place to derive inspiration for our new and emerging technologies. And um, uh, uh, over the years, I've been playing around with the watchmaker argument. And so, when it comes to biochemical finite state machines. You know, you could make a classic watchmaker argument where you could say, you know, that, you know, we know that when we encounter a finite state machine, there was a mind responsible for that. Right. When we see them in the cell, should we not draw the same conclusion? Uh, in, the, in the cell's design, I also produced something or proposed something called the watchmaker prediction, where I, I said that if indeed, you know, biochemical systems are the work of a creator – then as we invent new technology, we're going to see examples of that technology in the cell that uh, up to that point would have gone unrecognized as analogs to human technology because right. we hadn't made it yet. Right. And so in a sense, with finite state machines, you know, the, the fact that this research team for the first time recognized finite state machines you know, in cells uh, is a, a fulfillment of the watchmaker prediction. And then... You know, last but not least, there's the converse watchmaker argument that, you know, if indeed the technology in the cell is the work of a creator, then we would expect it to be so elegant that it could inspire new technologies. And so with the finite state machines, you could envision now uh, people looking at the operation of uh, of something like this, this you know, the, the Siri um, that the Euploides organism uses as maybe inspiration for a, a, a type of finite state machine that would have mobility, the, ca the capacity to move around. So you could begin to see how, how that interplay works. Now, real quickly, and then I'll, I'll bring everything to a close here, is um, a couple of days ago, I, I recorded an episode uh, of Seeing God in Biology. This is a series of episodes I'm recording with my, my friend and your friend, Ahmed Ezra, uh, for his channel, Finding Truth. And um, we talked about finite state machines. And so in preparation, I began to think about finite state machines anew. And I realized I had this aha moment that, in fact, most biochemical systems are probably finite state machines, that that framework may be a really powerful framework for interpreting uh, uh, biochemical phenomena. So in light of that, I began looking at intermediary metabolism. So this is a a diagram that, that you oh, get, to, yeah. get, to, get to master when you're a graduate student in biochemistry. And it's essentially showing the sum total of, or at least most of the, the core reactions that are involved inside cells where small molecules are interconverted one to another uh, through pathways, whether they're linear, branched, or circular pathways. So an example uh, would be something like glycolysis, where glucose is broken down into the 
into two three carbon compounds called pyruvate and in the process energy is extracted that the cell can use for its operation um, uh, so that so you know these pathways usually are energy generating pathways or they're used to build building block materials mm -hmm. another pathway that's circular is the Krebs cycle mm -hmm. where you're generating energy through the through the the uh, cyclical transition of one compound to the other, but many of the compounds that are in the Krebs cycle as intermediates are also involved in amino acid synthesis. And so what happens is a lot of the intermediates in like the glycolytic pathway are used in the, what's called the pentose shunt. And so what you have is this reticulated network of pathways where you have individual pathways that are designed to accomplish a particular task, but then the, the, some of the intermediates are also connected to other pathways. So it's a reticulated network. But when a lot of times what happens is people will simplify this diagram in this way on the left where they just show you the, 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 the core pathways and how they interconnect with one another. But when you look at that topologically, it's essentially a finite state machine diagram. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to me, the aha insight is, is it possible to look at intermediary metabolism in the, it, from the lens of a finite state machine? And this might actually give us some in understanding as to what's happening uh, with, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of metabolic processes, where you could begin to see these, you know, uh, different pathways as re representing different states and as the cell is transitioning from one state to the other, it's affecting the overall metabolism in the cell, the overall biochemical operations. Uh, and we go back to your really complicated diagram, which you're really looking at are dozens of finite state machines that are all coordinated and organized. Exactly, into, into much larger finite state machines that in turn... Yeah, so there's right. actually a, a, a subcategory, subdivision going on. Exactly. And then just real quickly, here's another example that I, I thought about, which is these are, this is showing a diagram uh, that is uh, gene networks where different gene products are interacting with other gene products to affect different biochemical operations in the cell. And again, topologically, it's very similar to a finite state machine. And in fact, I've seen a couple of people working in synthetic biology that are trying to design novel gene regulatory networks um, as part of their work in synthetic biology that are using the finite state machine concept uh, towards that end. So in other words, as you're saying, it's not only individual biochemical operations that are probably finite state machines, but they're integrated in a hierarchical level. Right. And this led me, and, and I'm sorry I'm taking so long here, this led me to another aha moment. About uh, 10 years ago, Paul Davies and Sarah Walker wrote this paper, and I wrote a blog article about, about it, uh, where they were arguing that we're never going to make any progress understanding the origin of life until we think about the problem in the right way. And Paul Davies is saying that, was saying in this article with Sarah Walker, his, his co-author, that really when you think about biochemical systems, they in effect are, they have algorithmic information. We, in other words, in, in that it's, it's that you have these biomolecules that are operating according to a set of instructions. And it's the instructions that really are what's critical. But as he points out, the instructions are harbored in the biomolecules themselves. And so in other words, what Davies was basically describing here, whether he realized it or not, is that biochemical systems are finite state machines. And that to understand the origin of life, you have to understand how is it that this algorithmic information emerged and then becomes instantiated in the biochemical machinery of life, right? And so this, in, in, in posing the question in, the, that ter in those terms, it says to me that this is really ultimately a theological problem, that to think of a, a cell as being a finite state machine really is highlighting the fact that this can only be explained as the work of a mind, right? So anyway, uh, uh, that, the, the, the new part of this discovery is really 
just the insight that I had preparing for my my conversation with with Ahmed Ezra, and then realizing this is a this is a, a, a different way of thinking about biochemistry that I'm completely unaware of. Uh, that that I think could be incredibly insightful and incredibly productive. That has bearing on all kinds of of scientific questions. Well, it has bearing on our technology too, because you were making the point at the beginning. We humans build these finite state machines. We see these finite state machines inside of living organisms, particularly the cell. And you know, you mentioned the hierarchy. I think when we go to the multicellular level, mm-hmm. you're again going to see these finite state machines. They're ubiquitous, and when we humans build a finite state machine, we put a lot of thought and engineering right. and intelligence into it. And I see this as an extension of the bio-inspired argument for the existence of God. Mm-hmm. I mean, both of us have written a lot of articles on bio-inspired uh, engineering, yeah. where uh, scientists and engineers look at organisms, uh, see this amazing design system machine, yeah. and they copy it. Uh, to produce something that we can use to further yeah. our technology. Yeah. I mean, a paper gets published, what, twice a week yeah. uh, that talks about some new bio-inspired technology. Yeah. The difference, though, is what we see in organisms is better than what we can produce in our technology, yep. Yep. which implies that the one that built these finite state machines in these different organisms right. at these different hierarchical levels must be more knowledgeable, more intelligent, yeah. and better financed than we human beings are. Yeah. And there you go, who's the candidate that matches that description? Yeah, exactly. That, that's well put. Well, you know, one of the criticisms that we hear a lot is that if you uh, make the claim that a creator is responsible for, for life, let's say, that God did it, then it just shuts down scientific inquiry. Well, this is an example of uh, this is a counterexample to that that assertion, because by thinking about again bi- biochemical systems and as you're pointing out, maybe even you know multicellular organisms as essentially finite state machines, it opens up an entirely new way of modeling and thinking about what's going on that could lead to very important insights. So this is actually demonstrating that thinking about things from a design perspective, from a creation model perspective, can lead to very fruitful advances in our understanding that you wouldn't necessarily uh, think to be the case from an evolutionary perspective. Let me be a little more explicit and see if you agree with me. Uh, If we come from a biblical worldview perspective, assuming that the God of the Bible is responsible for all these amazing machines and designs we see in the cell— then that will further our research in the sense that if we expect that to be the case, we're going to be researching these things in sufficient detail so that we can apply what we learn mm. there uh, to build better technology. Yeah. You know, we were created in the image of God. We design yeah. and create like he does. But if we look at what he's done, it's going to further our research. Right. I think this is a key example where a biblical worldview perspective is going to advance science right. more rapidly, more efficiently, for less money than a non-theistic approach to science. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thanks, Hugh. Uh, okay. For, for, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and, uh, and turn the— I'm just trying to drive home your point, Fuzz. No, 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 no. <laughs> it, it, you did a great job, and I appreciate that very much. Um, you know, and, and so, uh, yeah, so uh, I think it's—I've just taken up so much time here. I'm a little concerned about that. So why don't we, we transition to, to your— uh, Yeah, and i got some visuals here. Uh, But what I want to talk about is this paper that just got published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Mm -hmm. about the Chicxulub uh, crater event. And uh, this is a map of Mexico, and off to the right you can see the Yucatan Peninsula. And there's been papers published since 1980 by the Nobel laureate Alvarez uh, where uh, they noted that there was this enormous crater that they could see a thousand feet underground in the Yucatan Peninsula, indicating that uh, a big asteroid had hit there uh, some time ago. And uh, you know, since 1980, uh, they've been drilling down that thousand feet and were able to determine a date uh, for when that happened. You probably recall there was a major debate. Hey, we're not sure this asteroid collision mm-hmm. event 
really explains the extinction of the dinosaurs, because after all, we've got this conflict between evidence that indicates the crater hit on the land and evidence mm -hmm. that it hit in the ocean. And that got resolved, and the people realized it actually hit almost bullseye on the shoreline mm -hmm. of the Yucatan Peninsula, explaining why about half the data uh, shows a marine collision and half shows a land collision. Well, it's basically both. And uh, again, there's been debate going on. Well, we see all this evidence for worldwide massive volcanic eruptions. And so a lot of papers are published saying we don't think it's an asteroid at all. Mm -hmm. It's the volcanoes that brought about the extinction of the dinosaurs. And then you had people in the, on the astronomy side saying, no, we got strong evidence. It's a big asteroid. And the volcanic people are wrong. So there's this battle going mm -hmm. on between geologists and astronomers. Uh, was the extinction event that wiped out the last generation of the dinosaurs, the Cretaceous dinosaurs, a big asteroid, uh, or was a worldwide mm -hmm. volcanic eruptions? And it finally got resolved uh, when they were able to do precision dating of the moment when the volcanoes erupted and precision dating of when this asteroid struck in the Yucatan mm -hmm. Peninsula. And in both cases, they came up with the identical date, mm -hmm. 66 Point zero three eight uh, million years ago, so you know five decimal point precision on the date, and both dates match, and that led to research where they said, well, this had to be a big enough asteroid, at least ten kilometers in diameter, and quite likely one of the stainless steel asteroids, mm. which would have hit the Earth with sufficient force, it would have punctured through the crust down to the mantle, mm. and that would ignite volcanic eruptions all around the world. Well, this particular paper that just got published had one more feature mm. uh, to this uh, Chicxulub uh, crater event, basically uh, where they were able to go to the Yucatan Peninsula and come up with evidence that this asteroid hitting right on the shoreline of the Yucatan Peninsula would set up a family of sulfur aerosols into the atmosphere. Mm. You know, when you hit in the water, you're going to get a huge amount because basically the asteroid is going to go all the way down to the ocean floor. Mm -hmm. And there's sulfur compounds there that are going to mix with the water, mm -hmm. and it creates a huge I amount see. of aerosols. You get a different set of aerosols uh, from what hits on the land. And the combination of all these aerosols in the atmosphere basically brings on uh, what Carl Sagan called a nuclear winter, mm -hmm. making the point that we had an all-out nuclear war, uh, so much dust and aerosols would be put in the atmosphere. It would uh, significantly block out the heat and light of the sun and basically produce a three- or four-year-long winter. Well, this paper is basically saying mm. that happened, uh, but much more uh, is severe than what Carl Sagan uh, mm. talked about as classic uh, uh, you know, nuclear winter mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. And they were able to determine that the collision in the Yucatan Peninsula released the energy equivalent of three billion times the energy that was released by a combination of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombs that mm -hmm. ended World War II. So multiply that by three billion, and it gives you an idea. Uh, but they said this really explains why all the dinosaurs went extinct, and not just the dinosaurs, but a total of 75% Mm -hmm. of all the species of life on planet Earth, marine, terrestrial, plant, animal. Mm -hmm. It now ranks as the second biggest mass extinction event in the last billion-year history of the Earth, mm -hmm. the biggest one being the uh, you know, uh, Jurassic uh, Permian catastrophe yeah. that wiped out about 95% of all species in life. Uh, this has elevated the Chicxulub event uh, to second place mm -hmm. amongst the greatest mass extinction events. Uh, but it actually fits in to uh, a biblical creation model. And I'll just move to the next slide here. This shows you the luminosity of the sun throughout the history of life on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And when the sun is forming, it's accumulating mass. And uh, the luminosity of a star goes up by the fourth power of its mass. So in this sun is accumulating mass during its formation, it brightens mm -hmm. uh, to about twice the brightness that it has right now. Mm -hmm. But then it slowly loses mass uh, after 
uh, it begins to ignite nuclear fusion. And so you see the dimming of the sun. And uh, then when hydrogen fusion begins to uh, kick in, uh, the sun stops losing mass mm. in any significant way. And the fusion of hydrogen into helium basically gradually increases the efficiency of the nuclear furnace. So it explains why we've seen about mm. a 23% brightening of the sun from the origin of life into the present day. Now, where this uh, collision event fits into all of this is that life can only tolerate, uh, well, bacteria can tolerate about a 2% change in the luminosity of the sun without going completely extinct. Uh, but plants and animals uh, cannot tolerate it. It's less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Change the luminosity of 1%, advanced life uh, is eradicated uh, from the face of the earth. And so the question is, look at this 3.8 billion year history of life. How did it get sustained? Well, what I document in my book, uh, Improbable Planet, it's sustained by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere being gradually pulled down while the sun is getting brighter and brighter. And the only thing that can pull down those greenhouse gases, predominantly carbon dioxide and methane, is life. Mm. Different life forms uh, will pull differing amounts of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And it's a great way to understand the fossil record. If you look at the history of life over the past 3.8 billion years, you can see that life step by step has become more and more efficient and productive in pulling greenhouse mm -hmm. gases out of the atmosphere. So as the sun gets brighter and brighter, uh, that life uh, pulls out mm -hmm. uh, greenhouse gases at just the right amount to compensate uh, for the dimming of the sun. So just to summarize, it takes just right life on Earth at just right times, at just right amounts and diversity that's the major compensating factor for the sun's increasing uh, brightness. And the factor that's most significant, this accounts for 80% mm -hmm. of the compensation, uh, is where you have silicates. And what you see in the background is a silicate mountain range in Canada. But look at the bottom of the mountains. See all that sand and gravel at the bottom of the mountain? That's produced uh, by this chemical reaction where you got silicates, in this case I use calcium silicate at the top uh, left there uh, as just an example. It could be sodium, mm -hmm. it could be iron, uh, whatever. Uh, but what happens is those silicates react with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and water in the form of falling rain. Mm -hmm. So rain falling from the clouds, making contact with the silicates, uh, those raindrops act as a catalyst to cause this chemical reaction where the silicates get converted into carbon dioxide and water. So notice the water is at both ends. Yeah. It's a catalyst. Uh, but what happens is it pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and you wind up with the net reaction on the bottom. Uh, silicate plus carbon dioxide in the atmosphere makes a carbonate uh, plus sand, mm -hmm. silicon dioxide. And, uh, you know, one thing I love to point out, silicates are a relatively useless industrial product. But what you get out there are carbonates and sand, mm -hmm. uh, which are valuable. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where we get concrete from. Right. We take the carbonates, the sand, we make concrete. You can't do that with silicate. Yeah. So we actually get an industrial byproduct there. But we also are pulling carbon dioxide uh, out of the atmosphere. And uh, this basically shows you uh, very quickly, the history of life on planet Earth, where we begin with nothing but microbes. Mm -hmm. So this is a bacterial mat, and uh, that can pull greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Uh, but these are cryptogamic crusts, and uh, they're able to pull more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than just a bacterial mat. Uh, this is basically a, mm -hmm. uh, a symbiosis of lichen, uh, you know, fungi, and bacteria but they have a, a vertical structure like that, and therefore they're able to pull more mm -hmm. greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Then you've got ferns, and uh, most efficient of all are trees, mm -hmm. particularly conifers. And uh, you know this is from uh, Yosemite Valley, uh, Cathedral Peak here. But what you notice here is you have this 
mountain of a silicate and these trees are able to grow in that and penetrate the silicate. So instead of just having a smooth surface, thanks to these trees, you've got cracks and mm -hmm. uh, holes and cavities that allow more rain to be exposed to mm -hmm. the silicates and pull more greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. And life compensates in uh, you know, four different ways. It erodes the silicates to pull greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Tectonic plate movement mm -hmm. will bury, uh, mm -hmm. so you get a massive flood or volcanic reaction that buries a whole lot of uh, uh, you know, living material, which prevents the carbon in the plants from mm -hmm. decaying and being released to the atmosphere. It can change the chemistry of the atmosphere and the cloud cover. Mm -hmm. So if you reflect away more sunlight, that will pull down the temperature and it changes Earth's reflectivity because plants have different colors. Uh, but the bottom line is this. Only someone with a mind who knows the future physics of the sun, the earth, and the moon must remove no longer compensating life and replace it with just right life forms at just right times, in just right amounts, in just right locations. And the permian Triassic uh, mass extinction event was followed by an equally major mass speciation event. Likewise, what this paper is talking about, right. the event that took place approximately 66 million years ago, uh, wiped out the dinosaurs, but also those volcanic reactions uh, and that asteroid not only wiped out 75% of the species of life on planet Earth, it transformed the terrestrial environment. Before that asteroid collision, uh, North America, South America, Asia, and large parts of Africa were gigantic shallow seas. Mm. The volcanic eruptions and the asteroid transformed the continents of the Earth from having these vast shallow seas where it kind of looks like what it does today, which meant that you couldn't have dinosaurs existing after it. Mm -hmm. I mean, God could have created dinosaurs, but they wouldn't have had the water buoyancy uh, to be able to thrive like they did before the asteroid collision. So God created new life. Mm -hmm. That's where we see the radiation of uh, mammals and birds taking place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're the perfect creatures to thrive on the earth, given the lower level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, given the new terrestrial environment. Mm -hmm. And this is a principle that you actually see in Psalm 104, uh, where God speaks and says, referring to life, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are recreated and you renew the face of the earth. And so it takes that supreme being who says, okay, the sun's getting brighter. I need to remove life from planet Earth. He doesn't remove it all, but he removes the life uh, that is less efficient in pulling greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and replaces it with new life that is more efficient. But he also replaces it with life that can take maximal advantage of the change atmospheric conditions because you know certain life forms thrive with lots of carbon dioxide mm -hmm. in the atmosphere, other life forms don't. So as the methane and carbon dioxide are pulled out of the atmosphere to compensate for the sun, what we see in the mass extinction events is that we see new species of life that are optimized to take advantage of the new atmospheric conditions, the new terrestrial conditions, and that is where I would appeal to the rest of Psalm 104. Uh, it's the longest of the creation psalms in the Bible, but if you read the entirety of Psalm 104, its theme is God packing our planet with as much life as possible, as diverse as possible, and as extensive as possible. Mm -hmm. So from the perspective of the psalmist, we would anticipate, and we look at the history of life on planet Earth, we're going to see that the species of life at each epoch on planet Earth uh, has maximal uh, biomass, maximal biodiversity uh, to take advantage of the change conditions on the Earth all the way through, something you would never anticipate unless there's a mind mm -hmm. that exactly knows what those conditions are and creates life uh, at the optimal level with the maximum biodiversity and biomass. And, of course, we humans are the beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. 3.8 billion years of the crater packing the Earth with as much life as possible, as diverse as possible, 
means that we have all the biodeposit resources we need to launch and sustain mm -hmm. uh, global uh, civilization. So that's the bottom line. Yeah. And if people want to read more about it, oh, I love this verse in yeah. Psalm 104, 24. How many are your works, O Lord, in wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And if you read the rest of the psalm, it's always been full of his creatures. Yeah. You know, this is a God that's aggressively creating. And I like what you always say. It's a God that really enjoys what he creates. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's an elegance and a beauty that mm -hmm. we see uh, throughout there. I like what it says in the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. Everything is beautiful in its time. Yeah. And so we see this uh, throughout the history of life on planet Earth. Uh, Isaiah 45, 18, he did not create our planet to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. And again, if people want to read more yeah. about this, they can check out my book, Improbable Planet. And again, a reminder uh, that uh, if people want to dive into the social media platforms of Reasons to Believe, they can get that at RTB underscore official. Go to reasons.org. We have a YouTube channel. Yeah. And this show, Stars, Cells, and God, is featured on our YouTube channel. As you pointed yeah. out earlier, you can actually get a little bell. Does that actually ring a little bell on your computer, Fuzz, to let you know when a it, new one's released? Uh, it just sends a notification it to you. It sends you a notification. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But you can be notified when the yeah. next episode of Stars, Cells, and God will be released. And last time I checked, we have well over a thousand videos yeah. that you can watch on our YouTube channels. Yeah. So if you're not a subscriber, definitely subscribe. Yeah. Shortage of content is not a problem around here. Reasons to believe. That's for well, certain. Well, you're you're one of the people that are to blame for that, Buzz. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Hugh. Uh, that's that was a, a really fascinating discovery and just a reminder of God's providential care for life and in his orchestration of life's history with a high degree of precision that that fine tuning is of, of life's history and the and the types of life forms is 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 amazing and um, reminds us that the creator must care for us too yes yeah. he cares for all of the life he yeah. creates all right well thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of star cells and god I would invite you to enjoy to join the uh, discussion and the conversation about today's episodes in the comment section below. And please take a moment to share this video with friends and uh, uh, follow us on social media. Check out our website, reasons.org. And uh, uh, last but not least, remember that the more we know about science, the more we have reasons to believe. God bless you.